A portion of this video is brought to you by Surfshark. Most of us take for granted being able to toss our phones onto a charging pad to top them up. But what if we could charge our cars the same way? No more remembering to plug in your EV when you arrive at work or get home. Without having to even think about it, your car could always be charged up and ready to go. At the beginning of 2020, I spoke to a company that's leading the charge in wireless electric vehicle charging. And I thought it was time to revisit the topic to see where things stand and even get a chance to wirelessly charge a Tesla Model 3. There's been a lot of progress in the past two years. Is wireless EV charging almost here? Let's take a look. Wireless charging isn't anything new. Inductive charging has been around for a long time, and you probably use it almost every single day, like an electric toothbrush or your mobile phone. However, charging an EV is a completely different ballgame. We're talking about magnetic resonance charging, which is what the company Whytricity in Watertown, Massachusetts is bringing to EVs. Here's how Alex Grusin, Whytricity CEO, described it to me in 2020. Our technology is called magnetic resonance wireless power transfer, or okay. often just called magnetic resonance. And it, 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 it builds upon a history of, of, of induction charging, but it actually, it shifts it in a pretty radical new way, which is it makes the two coils each very efficient resonators tuned to a particular frequency. By making them efficient resonators, it's kind of like pushing my kid on a swing. Okay. Where little bits of, little taps of energy could result in the swing, you know, really moving. Right. In this case, because the source, the pad on the ground and the receiver that's built into the car are both tuned to the same frequency, around 85 kilohertz. Each of them is a very efficient harmonic resonator. The energy moves efficiently between the two. Traditional induction, you have to have sort of perfectly matched coils. Mm -hmm. They have to be very close to each other and they have to be in perfect alignment. But with magnetic resonance, you don't need that. You can have offsets, you can have different heights, and you can have different sizes. Just as long as you keep them sort of operating in the same sort of operating frequency. And that was really the breakthrough. Breakthroughs are all well and good, but as many people point out in my comments, will we ever get to see this in the real world? That's precisely why I decided to revisit them to see how things are progressing. And one of the big obstacles in getting wireless EV charging to market was ratifying a standard across the industry. Whytricity worked with the SAE International on the J2954 wireless charging standard, a name that rolls right off the tongue, for about a decade, which was released in October of 2020. That unlocks a lot of what's happening right now. And when I originally talked to Whytricity in 2020, they were very focused on supplying the technology, but things shifted a bit since then. Alex filled me in on where things stand today. For the first several years of the business, we were in a technology transfer and licensing model. But the objective has always been that as the market happened, you know, and vehicles coming to market with our technology embedded, there would become an opportunity to sell chargers and charging equipment. So that's the transition. We're going from sort of enablement and the first launches right. to actually deploying our own product into the field. Whytricity is going to be bringing its own line of products to market. As proof of concept, they've been retrofitting existing EVs with wireless charging, so it shouldn't be a surprise that they did a Tesla Model 3. But while I was there, I stumbled upon something I wasn't expecting to see. They were actively working on two Ford Mustang Mach-E's. After talking to some of the engineers and team, it's pretty clear that it's challenging to design a retrofit for a car that wasn't originally designed with wireless charging in mind. But before getting into some of those challenges, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark. I always recommend using a VPN when using public Wi-Fi, but VPNs can be very useful even when you're at home. A lot of online services use some pretty sophisticated commercial tracking and machine learning to apply very targeted advertising. A VPN can protect you from some of that. If Surfshark's clean web does a great job blocking ads, trackers, and malicious websites, making it safer to use the internet even at home. And you can even make it look like your IP address is coming from a completely different country. This can come in handy if you want to stream a video that's only available from a specific location. And one of the best parts of Surfshark is that it's easy to set up on all of your devices, whether that's iPhone or Android, Mac or PC. Surfshark is the only VPN to offer one account to use with an unlimited number of devices. Use my code to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. Link in the description below, and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now back to some of the challenges when designing wireless charging retrofits. Now, some of the considerations you have to take into account are space. You have to be able to squirrel away the charging pad and equipment on the underside of the car. 
You also have to wire into the electrical system, override safety protocols of the charging system while also designing your own safety protocols to replace or supplement those. For instance, on the retrofitted Tesla Model 3, while you're wirelessly charging your car, they implemented a software override that disables the external charging door from being opened because it's technically live even though you aren't physically plugged in. If you manually pry the door open, the wireless charging system automatically shuts down. Now, what they've demonstrated on the Tesla Model 3 is extremely safe, but this does show the level of care that has to be taken when designing a retrofit like this. Yeah, it's actually quite a bit of work if you're doing it sort of independently as an aftermarket thing. You know, we are developing aftermarket kits. The primary focus is going to be sort of commercial fleets, and we'll make it available to some enthusiasts in the space you know, as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the core of our business has always been about enabling the automakers. For the Design for Wireless Charging from the Ground Up partnerships, they've partnered with Hyundai on the Genesis GV60, which is available in South Korea. The car's built-in screens and cameras are used to help guide the driver to the proper charging position. In China, FAW is bringing wireless charging to its Hangqi EHS9, a product name that also rolls right off the tongue. And what's really cool about FAW's rollout is that they've also paired charging with autonomy, so the car parks and charges itself. Now, there's more partnerships in the works, so I expect that we'll be seeing a trickle of news coming out of Ytricity in the months and years ahead. Now, that's all well and good, but what's it like to use? On that point, I got a chance to try it out for myself. Since the Tesla Model 3 is a retrofit, they had to add a secondary screen to give the driver real-time feedback. And I know some people will see that as a downside, but I actually don't. Just recently, I added an extra screen behind my steering wheel on my Model 3 to get Apple CarPlay into my car. Not to go off on a tangent, but I really like the screen. It's nice having a speedometer there when I'm not using CarPlay, and then the addition of CarPlay is a game changer for me. Now, Ytricity is doing something similar. When you're not near the charging pad, the screen displays the speedometer. Now, keep in mind that everything you're seeing is a work in progress and not the final UI, since right now they're focused on nailing the functionality. And no offense to engineers, I've spent my entire career working closely with software engineers, and they can do some amazing things, but they aren't always the best at UI design. Now, I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit nervous about nailing this on the first try, <laughs> but I did it. As Alex explained with how magnetic resonance charging works, you don't have to be precisely aligned for the optimal charge. There's a little wiggle room and a window that you're aiming for. And what really impressed me was the level of accuracy that they can pinpoint for how the pads are aligned, right down to the millimeter. Now, obviously, they won't be showing millimeter readouts on the final product, that's just for development, but you can see that there's a fair amount of wiggle room on the alignment. For charging speeds, it's on par with what you get at home or on a lot of destination chargers today. It's an 11 kilowatt charger, which can add about 35 miles an hour onto the car. It's on par with what I have at my house when I plug into a Tesla wall connector. And there's an important point to bring up around charging speed and efficiency. That 11 kilowatts isn't the limit of magnetic resonance charging. It's the limit of the consumer model that they're building and releasing. We have under development higher power solutions for last mile vans, for middle mile trucks, for shuttle buses, and for transit buses. So you can do anywhere from say, you know, 50 to 75 kilowatts all the way up to hundreds of kilowatts for those vehicles with the same sort of architecture that we're deploying down to, you know, 11 kilowatts for a passenger car. It's all about designing the system for the specific use case. If you're targeting a use case for home or business destination charging, 11 kilowatts is a great target, but they can scale this way up based on the use case. As for efficiency, this one can be hard to wrap your head around because all of us may equate our experience using a Qi charger with your phone, but this is very different. Qi charging is usually around 80% efficient at best and requires very specific contact and alignment. Magnetic resonance is about 99% efficient over the air gap, so it's virtually identical to plugging in. When you factor in the full system, circuit to inverter to battery, it's about 92% efficient, which is right around where wired charging is. That's not the part that gets me excited about wireless EV charging though. There's two other use cases that get unlocked, and one of those I've already touched on, and that's autonomy. FAW's autonomous parking and charging car is where all of this is heading in the future. If you remember a number of years ago, Tesla was experimenting with a snake-like robotic charging arm <laughs> that could automatically plug into your car. It's actually kind of frightening. It's a fairly complicated solution that has lots of moving parts and can break down and need maintenance. A wireless charging system sidesteps those problems completely. The other thing that gets unlocked is vehicle to grid. Now we're starting to see more EVs coming to market that support bi-directional charging, so you can power your home from something like a Ford Lightning truck in a blackout. The one thing that's bothered me about vehicle to grid is that you have to remember to plug in to take advantage of some of vehicle to grid's benefits beyond just the power in the blackout. With bi-directional wireless charging, not only do you never have to worry about forgetting to charge your car for the next day's drive, 
but your largest battery in your house is ready to participate in peak shaving programs or blackouts automatically. Most people, if the car is battery's fully charged, they don't plug in. Exactly. And that's when it's most useful for V to G. Yeah. And if it's not plugged in, it's like useless. With yeah. wireless, if it's parked, it's available. So I think the wireless V to G really is kind of going to be an amplifier for V to G in general, because all of those parked vehicles suddenly become available. What about the cost of the system? Well, Alex broke this down for me too. You know, well, obviously we're at the early days. Yep. I can tell you that the part that goes on the car, we call it a vehicle assembly or a wireless power receiver, costs about the same today as an onboard charger, which you would have on there. So, you know, five, six, 700 bucks to an automaker to install on the car. We have a roadmap of product that gets that down to a few hundred bucks. So, so within a few years, adding wireless charging to your car will be kind of the same as, you know, adding 20 inch wheels or a nav system or a, a moonroof. Mm -hmm. The charger for the home, it's a couple grand. And I think that's going to be the market price. It'll be roughly about a thousand bucks more than a, a nice premium, you know, plug in charger. The last time I talked about Y-Tricity, I got a lot of questions about the safety of the system. And for instance, what happens if you have a cat that likes to crawl under your car? This is another one of those things that can be a little hard to wrap your head around because the system operates at a low frequency, which is very safe. The most popular home addition these days is like an induction cooktop, mm -hmm. right? Well, induction cooktop operates under a, a finite set of radio laws, totally safe. Same apply for us. If a soda can or a coin or something were to go on the pad, while it's charging, mm -hmm. it would heat up. We could put energy into it, it also means we can detect it. So we have a series of sensors we've designed that notice if any metallic object is anywhere near the, the pad, it turns off. Right. Same for your cat. If you were to reach under and like kind of go near the pad, the system would turn off. Does that mean it's not safe? No, it actually is safe. If anything goes near it, we're gonna turn off, give you a notification, and you know you're, you go about your business. So when can we get our hands on wireless charging for our EVs? It's already on the market in certain regions, but why Tristy is trying to ramp up with new partnerships. Just this past June, Siemens invested $25 million into why Tristy to help accelerate the rollout, and they see this as a multi-billion dollar market. But given how slowly the automotive industry typically moves, it may be several more years before we see this trickle out in a meaningful way. At least we should start seeing aftermarket options for specific models hitting the market at some point down the road too. I'm pretty excited for the future of this tech, and I can't wait to get it. So you're still undecided? Do you want wireless charging for your EV? Jump in the comments and let me know. And be sure to check out my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll be discussing some of your feedback. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones over here. And thanks to all of my patrons for your continued support. And thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.